Hello and welcome. This is Annie Rogers. And on behalf of Attitude Magazine, I would like to welcome you all to today's ADHD Experts webinar titled The Middle School Survival Guide for Students with ADHD and Executive Function Deficits. I'm also very pleased to introduce our expert presenter, Mary D. Sklar. She is an educator who has spent more than 25 years teaching time management, planning, and organization from the perspective of the brain. She's the creator of the Seeing My Time program, the Set Up Success Student Planners, and the Amazon bestseller, 50 Tips to Help Students Succeed. Her company, Executive Functioning Success, offers online training programs for families, adults, professionals, and educators. So today, we're very pleased to have Mary D here. She's gonna help us to understand why exactly middle school is so, so challenging and draining for students with ADHD and executive dysfunction. Um, we'll learn how the ADHD brain development lags behind and what that means for executive functions. Um, then we'll also learn about problem solving from the perspective of the ADHD brain and its needs and talk about ways that parents can support their teen's development while also encouraging independence. Um, the sponsor for this week's webinar is Play Attention. For more than 25 years, Play Attention has been helping children and adults thrive and succeed by enhancing brain health and performance. It's NASA-inspired technology and cognitive exercises improve executive function, and its programs include a lifetime membership and a personal executive function coach to customize your plan along the way. Tell Play Attention the areas you want to improve, and they will create a customized neurocognitive training plan to help you achieve those goals. Um, to schedule a free consultation, visit playattention.com or call 800-788-6786. Use the coupon code ADDMAG1020, that's 1020 for today's date, to receive $200 off your Play Attention program. Okay, just a few more housekeeping items, then we'll get going. Um, Listeners tuned into the live webinar may download the slides right now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. If you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, please look for instructions in an email that you will receive about an hour after the live broadcast. And for those of you listening in replay or podcast mode, please visit the webinar replay page on the Attitude website. Uh, you can find that at attitudemag.com slash podcast dash 329 for access to both the accompanying slides and the certificate of attendance options. So after all of that, I am extremely pleased to hand over the microphone to Mary D. Sklar, who will lead us through a wonderful presentation on Middle School Survival Guide. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, here's my promise to all of you. My goal is to help make things better for you. And we're going to do that today by first focusing on the brain. And then we'll spend some time focusing on spaces, uh, what you can do in your actual home environment to help uh, your middle school or do well this year, better, better. And then we will talk about time and its relationship to how, uh, to getting things done and how you can help your kids understand time a little bit better. So going forward here, we're going to always need to think about this. We need to honor the brain's needs. So the brain likes things to be predictable, predictability. And that's a real challenge this year because nothing has been predictable, okay? And that's tilting all of us into a state of anxiety because we can't predict what's going to be happening next. So we need to, within our homes, create as much predictability as possible. 
because the outside world is not offering us much in the way of predictability. So I want you to be thinking about how you can create your home environment to feel very predictable, because that's going to make the brains of your children feel better. And we also need to be very consistent, to have consistency. That's what the brain likes. This was something, uh, to be perfectly honest, I struggled with as a parent. Um, I was not so good at being consistent. I've gotten vastly better in my older age. But I want you to be thinking about how you can set up patterns, for instance, for predictability and consistency, holding to those patterns, those routines. Um, ordered structure. Now, I know you're going, yeah, but we have ADHD. <laughs> but this is what we need, every brain needs. We need to have some kind of ordered structure. And in this case, I'm talking about our environment um, and the place where they're going to be doing their schoolwork. And that's that or organized spaces and the structures that go with it. Um, now, we're going to always start with the brain development. Everything that I do uh, starts with this slide. And I, even though you may have a good background in uh, understanding the aspects of the executive functioning brain, I want to remind you, this is very important. This is a model for uh, executive functioning. This comes from Peg Dawson and Richard Guare. It's a good model because it shows some of the complexities of the brain and it's not too overwhelming and it's not too obscure. So. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. This is my, my personal definition for executive functioning, is it's purposeful actions. That's the part that I focus on, is our purposeful actions. And what I mean by that is executive functions, many of them do not, most of them do not happen automatically, certainly in this particular model. Um, most of them require us to choose, to think. And this is the challenge you have working with younger students is that they may not have um, a, strong, a strongly developed executive functioning system. So what I want to do on this page pretty quickly is just go over these different executive functions. I'm going to be very fast. If you want to um, learn more about them, I know my 50 Tips book has a, has goes in depth in the back to kind of do a self-evaluation for this. But these are the skills that... Um, your students need and you need. So you can kind of go to little plus minuses here, thinking about your student's brain would be a minus, uh, your brain is it a plus or a minus. So if it's a strength, you give yourself a plus. If it's a minus, that brain gets a, a, a negative mark. And um, many of them will actually be plus minuses. So I'm gonna go pretty quickly through this, but we're gonna start with metacognition. And my definition for metacognition is thinking about my thinking. So when you write that down, I want that personal pronoun my in the definition, because that's what we want people to begin to do is to be thinking about my personal choices in my brain. What am I choosing to do? That's metacognition. Finishing things. Um, do you have a brain that likes to get things finished or do you have a brain that likes to, you know, you start some things like, yeah, that's okay, but, you know, I don't really care if I finish it or not. That's, you know, you started to play the clarinet and you went to two lessons or you've got 10 knitting projects going. Um, you know, that's a brain, yeah, I don't care if it's done or not. But other brains like to get things done. This can be a plus minus. Good at finishing things I want to do. Not so good at finishing things I don't want to do. Um, next comes mental flexibility. And in this case, I'm not talking yoga flexibility. I'm talking about your brain's ability to go with the flow, to transition easily and smoothly, to problem solve when things don't go according to plan. So this executive functioning skill has been in high demand and placed a lot of stress, under a lot of stress this year, because everything has been shifting and moving really, really fast. So if you have children who typically are on the spectrum, maybe in addition to the ADHD, that typically is a brain that's not very flexible, that that brain really likes consistency, really likes to have things be structured and ordered. And when things are novel and new, they have a hard time adjusting. So think about the strength of your particular child and their needs and, and your own brain's needs. Um, focus, of course, always comes up with uh, ADHD. Um, this one can be a plus minus. Uh, the most ADHD brain out there can often hyper-focus on a video game, for instance, and um, 
can play it for hours, but you give that same student three math problems and the spider in the corner is suddenly really entertaining. <laughs> okay, so that is often a plus minus. Self-control, um, this, this is your brain's ability to control your behavior. I'm gonna slow down here to control your behavior so that you meet the expectations of the people around you. So that's what self-control response inhibition is for me. It's like your brain's ability to control yourself so you do what you're supposed to do. And this is where a lot of ADHD kids have a lot of challenges is, is that self-control piece is not fully matured. Um, it's, it's directly tied to sleep. I'm going to toss that in quickly. So if your children are not sleeping well um, or not getting enough sleep, then their self-control will dissipate earlier in the day. So sleep is really important. That's one of those consistencies that we consistent um, structural components in your home that you need to put in place is setting everybody to bed at this about the same time because that will actually help their self-control the next day. Working memory, um, this is that part of, part of your brain. I call it conscious thinking. I'm the only person in the universe who uses that definition, I think. But it's the part of your brain that um, you're using right now to think. And the capacity of your brain, your working memory capacity, is pretty darn small. I think of it as a really small Post-it note. Um, it's the typical adult can only store four to seven chunks of information on their working memory, in their working memory at one time. So this one's important to understand because your students, some of them depending upon their ages and their brains, they will not be able to hold on to more than one or two or uh, max three things. So what this looks like is it's really, really easy for parents. There's a teacher version of this, but teachers will do it. Parents will definitely do it. They will overload that working memory capacity for a young person. And what happens like this, so you say to your son, oh, we'll pick a boy, okay. And you say to your son, okay, I want you to please take these clothes upstairs and put them away. Don't dump them on the floor, please. And bring down your dirty dishes. We're gonna have ants upstairs. And you said you're gonna make your bed. Remember, there's no allowance if you don't get your beds made. And um, better hurry up because we're gonna get ready to go. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna go out. We're gonna go to this event or do something today would be rare, right? But we're gonna go out of the house and we're gonna go, we gotta be gone. Let's go, hurry up, chop, chop. Well, you just overloaded your child's working memory. It's like you took a fire hose to their working memory. So if you want, you know, compliance, because when you do that, when you brain dump like that, um, you, you just overload them completely. And you're going to be lucky if they do any of the things that you ask them to do. So if you want compliance, I want you to ask one thing at a time, just one thing at a time. That's my quick little hit to you. Okay, planning and prioritization, that's future thinking and knowing what to do next, what's important. Um, time management, of course, is uh, making good choices with your time, organizing your things, that's all the stuff in your environment. If you have piles everywhere, um, that is a brain that has difficulty with organization. Uh, you say, oh, but Mary D, I've got, I know exactly where it is. It's either in that pile or that pile. Well, your brain, that's not organization. Your brain actually does not like piles. It will raise, there have been some studies, there's a study that shows that um, piles actually raise the cortisol level, and that's a stress hormone, in your brain. And right now, we don't need more stress. So I've been purposefully going around my house trying to limit as many piles as possible. I don't have very many, but they creep up, you know? And it's just like everyone I look at raises the stress level in my brain. Then we have trouble with getting started. Is that an easy thing for your brain to do or not? That's an executive functioning skill. And then controlling emotions is the biggie. So that's a very quick overview of all of these executive skills. The more minuses you have on this brain, the harder it's going to be to move through life and get things done, which is the requirements of school.
Okay, and the requirements of living with a family is to get things done. So the more minuses you have, the harder it's going to be. So let's take a second and look at those executive skills that are required to independently work at your seat if you're in a classroom setting or if you're at home doing your homework. So these are the skills that are needed. And this is from Peg Dawson and Richard Guerra. This was adapted from them. Um, understand directions. That requires good metacognition, good self-awareness, good problem solving. Uh, getting started independently, that requires what they call task initiation. Get uh, continue working despite distractions, that requires sustained attention or focus. Um, to ask for help when needed, oh, this is a biggie. Okay, everybody's always telling your ADHD kids, be a self-advocate, ask for help. Well, you guys, it's hard to do because it requires advanced metacognition and problem solving. And we're going to see in a few minutes just where that falls out age-wise. Um, it's very, very hard. It's an unrealistic expectation. You can teach and guide and model students, but just to tell them, go ask your teacher, there's a whole lot of stuff, emotions connected to that, a lot of inability to do that on their own. Uh, you want to get your kids to that point. But you don't, so you don't want to always defend them, but they <laughs> did not defend them. That's the right answer. You don't want to always be the advocate for your child, but as they age, you want to start shifting that self advocacy over, but it has to be taught. Um, e as stick with it long enough to complete, to complete it. That's sustained attention and goal directed persistence. Making, uh, correcting careless mistakes, metacognition. See, we have a theme here. Uh, finishing work on time, that requires good time management. And then remembering to turn it in on time or push the button for send, um, that actually is working memory. And working memory is just something that is in our brains. It is there, okay? And it will mature with age, um, but it always drives me nuts when kids get marked down for turning things in late. It's often a situation of, of working memory failing them um, to be able to remember to turn something in. And you shouldn't be punished for a working memory problem. That is innate part of your brain. So you can see here, if you're having trouble getting your kids to sit down and just work independently, it requires a lot of these executive skills in order to be able to do that. So taking a look at a, another model for executive functions, um, this comes from a, a book of Anderson's, it's called, let me have to look closer here. Um, it's called uh, Executive Functions and the Frontal Lobes, A Lifetime Perspective. I adapted this, this from their book. So what you see here is the different skills, there's just three of them that are required time-wise. So if you look at the green dots that are going up there, that, that's, they are the on the top, and as you look left to right, you see those first. That is inhibitory control. That's self-control. Look at how it sort of, it always advances as you age, and then right when you hit middle school, it slows down. Look at that. Right when we start asking them to juggle more responsibilities, more teachers, more projects, um, all the social interaction stuff that's going on, it's harder for them to self-control. It's not because they're bad, lazy kids. It's just developmentally, suddenly it's harder. And we have made the problem worse by overloading them with very high expectations at that age level. Then if you take a look at the pink line there, um, pink dots, those are, that's working memory. And look at how long it takes for that working memory to develop. It doesn't develop clear into your mid-20s and it stays pretty good in through your mid-20s. I think if they were to re-update this slide, they would find that it starts dropping down slowly in your 30s, and uh, then it just plummets. <laughs> I have plummeted off my working memory. Okay, it's a challenge. Um, and then goal setting and problem solving, they've combined two executive skills. Goal setting is future thinking, that's the yellow dots. And problem solving is another way of saying metacognition. So look at how old they have to be to care about the future. 
<laughs> you know, as a parent, you're going, oh, you got to get good grades, or, you know, if you don't get good grades, you're going to always be home, blah, 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 you'll never get a job, blah, blah, blah. Because you're thinking about the future. Your young people, your middle school kids, they can't even imagine the future. And yet we're expecting them to act like they care, and they really don't. They live in the now. And uh, problem solving, that's that metacognition. Look at how long that takes. It's a very long process. And what you need to know is that the, matur the maturation of the prefrontal cortex is somewhere between 25 and 30 plus years of age. That's a long time. And, you know, so take a deep breath if you have middle school students. <sighs> Breathe deeply, okay, because... You're in a marathon, we're not in a sprint. It's gonna take a long time and your young people continue to need support, more like coaching support from you as they mature in order to problem solve and learn from their mistakes and start thinking about goals. And the other thing you need to know, and you may already know this, but I'm gonna remind you, executive functioning skills um, are typically three to five years uh, delayed in those with ADHD, ADD, ADHD. So those kids, um, they fall in over here. That would be a, like a 14-year-old freshman with ADHD. They are really acting more like a middle school student. And I know I have a little young man in my practice right now who's 13 years old, and he acts more like a fourth, fifth grader in terms of his social behaviors and his responses to the universe. And it's a big problem because he's also a very gifted child in other aspects of his brain, but um, his maturity is way below the expectations. His executive functioning maturity is way below the expectations of his private eighth grade program. So you can see right here, we're setting up these kids to struggle because we're having unrealistic expectations. So I'm gonna pause for a second and I want you to write down what is your key idea, very important. I know I'm not gonna give you too much time, but you can think about this when you come back and look at your, your slides because we wanna think about what have I learned from this? So going forward, you need to think about the family as a system because you don't wanna go from that, you wanna to get to this. So in order for your home to work better, I want you to learn to calm your emotional brain. Because during these times of such stress, having the kids in the home, trying to work from home, oh my goodness, it's just such a mess. Our brains are totally frazzled. So I'm gonna teach you a very quick little calm your brain exercise. So take your fingers and put them behind your neck and um, Take your elbows and arch, push them back so that you get that little arch in the lower part of your back. That's what you're aiming for is that little pressure point on your lower back, not to hurt yourself, but just a little bit of pressure there. You're, um, and then take a few breaths. It also helps to push into your feet a little bit because that gets you out of your brain and into your sensory system. So if you take a few breaths within that posture, you are calming your brain. You're activating what's called your parasympathetic nervous system. You're pushing pressure on the vagus nerve, and that's actually ends up calming and slowing down your heart rate. So calm your brain, you guys. You got to do this a lot. Uh, very important. Teach your kids to do it also. And then the other problem you have is you need to act like a teacher, <laughs> which is really hard. You don't want to be a teacher, but if you have kids at home, and this works for homework too, um, teachers don't leave the room. And I know you guys don't want to hear that, but we don't leave the room. I used to be a classroom teacher, as I told, <laughs> told Annie earlier, in a galaxy far, far away. Um, you're monitoring behavior as a classroom teacher. You're checking to see that everybody's following the rules. You're checking to see if people understand their assignments. Do they need any help? So they are monitoring behavior. And the other thing that I highly recommend you do, and, and you're going to get some pushback on this, would be my guess. Um, but I want you to set up the routine, the expectations, the consistency that you ask your middle school, high school students to sh have them show you their completed work. Now, I do not want you to correct it. You don't look at what's in it. You just see that they have completed the assignment and that they have uploaded it to the right place. Um, because otherwise, they'll fudge. Okay, <laughs> I know this. I was a mother. I am a mother. Okay, my kids are grown at this point. They made it. But I didn't do this when, when my son was in high school. And it was one of the biggest mistakes I ever made was not 
helping him to be accountable for really finishing things. And the other thing that's really important for parents, and a lot of parents avoid this because they're a little bit afraid of the technology, they're afraid of, they don't want to interfere and be too much of a helicopter parent with their kids. Um, but you really need to understand the school distance platform. Um, where do they upload their grades? How do they find out if they're behind? How, where is the calendar for future assignments or projects? You really need to understand this because because your kids are really great at video games and surf on the web does not mean that they do well in your online school uh, plat distance platforms. Everyone is different. Everyone has its weaknesses. And many of them overload the working memory. And what that looks like is there's too many clicks to get to um, where they're going. Like, where's my teacher's uh, assignments for today? And that's hard because the kids think they're going to hold it in their brains, and they don't. As they click around and out, it disappears. So parents, you really need to understand this platform. Work with your kids. They should be able to show you exactly how it works. And if they don't, you need to help them figure out how it works. And then the other thing you need to set up are workstations, all right? Uh, bedrooms do not make great workstations. Now, particularly messy ones. Now, I realize that in some homes, this is not an option to work uh, all together in one space. Um, but I, it's not my ideal choice. Some kids can work in their bedrooms by themselves. But other kids just really can't. Like, my daughter could have pulled it off. No problem. My son, no way. Another big mistake I made was I should have set him down at the dining room table and had him do his work in a space where I could monitor what he was doing. And I told him that when he was about 18, 19 years old. I said, you know, if I had to do it over again, I would have set you down at the dining room table and have you watch do your homework. I wasn't going to do your homework. I was going to watch you do your homework. And he looked at me. Nobody said. He said, you should have. That's what the other kids were doing, moms were doing. Oh my gosh, you guys, it was like a knife in my stomach, okay, in my belly, because I, I thought he could do it and he really couldn't. And he needed that kind of support and consistency. He made it in the end, but um, he could not do it on his own. So rather than do that, if at all possible, um, because remember your, your adolescents are social animals. They don't like to be set off by themselves in rooms by themselves. So they're very isolated that way. So we want to set up a workstation. I want you to think of your home as being more of one of those, uh, we work spaces, one of those big office buildings where people just rent tables and they all come together and they, they work on their own individual table, but there's group coffee and there's a group snack station. So there's some social stuff going on. Um, you want to set that up if possible in your home. And if you'll notice, this is actually my workstation. This is what I'm doing, looking at right now as I'm talking to you. I have, um, this is a real fancy standing desk <laughs> option, okay? Particularly for your ADHD kids, they need to stand. They will pay better attention, many of them, if they are standing, because your body has to, your brain has to pay more attention when you're standing, when you're sitting, it can just go slump and check out. So I often recommend that people stand while they're doing their homework and particularly while they're doing Zoom meetings. So my fancy standing desk is simply an upside down old IKEA bookshelf, all right? You can figure out anything that you can to create a simple uh, rising up of those laptops or, or Chromebooks that they're using. So what you see here, and this is what you need, you need to have a clock. Every one of their, where your kids are working, they need to have an analog clock so they can see the passing of time and they know when they need to show up for their uh, next class session. Or if they're at home doing homework in the evening, the same thing. They need to see time passing. Uh, what else is on there? I have my day plan. My calendar is there with me. Um, I have a, a little jar of nuts to chew on, to, ch to, to snack on. Very important to recharge your brain, so let your students do that. I have a, gla a mug there that is usually just full of, of water. And I have some timers that are there. I have all my core power cords, pencils. So I've really set up my little workstation. So think about how you can set that up for your students. And what I want you to remember is kids can't do what they can't do. Most, many times I find that p parents are complaining about their kids um, not starting their homework, not doing their homework. Often, you guys, it's because they're confused. 
So always ask the question, instead of getting angry with them, instead of just assuming they're being lazy, you need to take a deep breath. Remember that little action I told you, lean back, calm your brain, take a few deep breaths, feel your feet, and then ask them, where's the confusion? Are you stuck on something? Because they can't problem solve. I won't go into how simple <laughs> of things that they can get stuck on, but they can get stuck on very simple things, wording, they might be missing some prior knowledge, um, and it's the parent's job now, if you're, if you're uh, doing distance learning, you're gonna have to be the teacher to help get them unstuck if you possibly can. Sometimes they need to go back to the teacher, but it would probably be more efficient if you can help them. So you might schedule your day so that there's a couple of different check-in times, your kids know when they are, that may have to be flexible given your work schedule, but you should schedule with your kids a time to just check in. Are you stuck on anything? Can I help confirm? Uh, clear up the confusion because your high, even your high school kids will get stuck and not be able to clear themselves up uh, and, and move forward. So what's your key idea for that? All your spaces. And that brings us to time. And the problem with time is that it is abstract. It is invisible. What is, show me five minutes. What is five minutes? Okay. Well, in order to help your kids, we have to make this abstract concept concrete and visible, just like a, an hourglass. We need to see time passing. So when I'm working with kids, I help them uh, draw what I call time circles. And these are a visual representation for time. And I'll show you in a minute here how that works. We want to have one hour um, is what it, circle represents the face of an analog clock. And then we have, um, so if we're going to do something for an hour, we would fill in the whole circle. If we're going to do something for a half an hour, we would fill in a half of the circle, 15 minutes, et cetera. Five minutes is just a sliver. So these time circles make time concrete and visible. And this is how we're going to use them. I want your kids to become time scientists and you as an adult, the same thing, because people just guess. We don't have, typically we have terrible understanding of the passing of time, particularly for ADHD brains. That kids think that homework assignments will take up all of their time, doesn't matter what the subject is, or they think, oh, no big problem, I got lots of time, and, because they think it's gonna take up very little time. So in order to be good at time management, you have to collect data instead of guessing. So what you see on the screen is a student wrote down math and they made a guess of a half an hour. English was a guess of an hour. Now I broke that into two small half hour circles. I recommend they break things that are bigger chunks like English into smaller chunks because your brain um, doesn't like big chunks. It'll, it'll make task initiation getting started harder. So you want to make it into a smaller achievable goal. And then the chore of emptying the dishwasher, oh, it takes me, you know, 20 minutes. Well, when they time these things by hitting, using the stopwatch on their, on either a timer or their phone, they find out that it really doesn't take that much time or, or let's put it this way, time is not what they expected. So the math took less time. English, however, took up a whole nother half an hour. That's good information. So going forward, they need to allow a bigger space of time to work on English. And you know, emptying the dishwasher, five minutes, not that much time. So, and then you can determine the average length of time required for homework by doing this assignment over, the, over five days, collecting the data and then dividing by five, uh, usually get a good average, you need to take five data points and then you can divide it and find out what the average is going to be. Because the kids will say, oh, math, I don't know how long math takes. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's shorter. Yes, that is true. But we wanna get an average so that we come out close to what we're going to need to finish math. So be a time scientist. I, I believe this is something that we can get you access to on my website, uh, but you can just create your own little form, put it on a, um, clipboard and remind people to just start timing things. All these things, very valuable tool. The dry erase board is another great tool and I'm talking about a dry erase board that is big like this, that's on an easel that you can pick up and move around because you wanna stick it in your face and you get things done when it's in front of you. So this dry erase board supports future thinking. That's what you're trying to do with your kids. Future thinking is critical. 
and we have to help them start to think about it. So that's why we write down plans. What do I have to do today? What's my homework for today? What are my chores for today? That's all future thinking, and you want them to write that down. It also supports accountability. Uh, if students are putting down what they have to work on today, parents can just look at the board. They don't have to nag them. They don't have to lean over their shoulders. They can see things being crossed off on the board. And um, like I said, it limits that nagging and parent anxiety and, again, develops daily planning. So the dry erase board is one of my favorite tools and one of many parents' fa favorite tools. And everybody in the family gets their quadrant. So here's a quick picture of a of a dry erase board for a whole family. And the thing to remember is it's not the parents list for the kids to do or the parents list for the spouse to do. Everybody writes their own list. And it's very important to put down the time circles so that you don't end up putting down a mega, mega, mega list that is not possibly going to fit in your day. So time circles and everybody taking responsibility is very important. So here's the to-do list that they can put up, English, hour and a half. Well, when they put everything up and you start crossing that off, you actually get dopamine hits in your brain. It's quite wonderful. And you feel good. It's like, oh, yes. And that motivates you to move on to the next thing on your list. So they can use little whiteboards. They can use paper. They can use all kinds of different things. But very important. I know kids balk. I don't want to write it down. It's their working memory. If it's not working and they're starting to fail, their drop things are dropping you know, through the cracks, it's not working. It's your working memory. You have to support it. You have to support it by writing things down. So have the kids time exactly how long it takes to go online, find the information for class A, and write that down. Teach them to use shorthand, if, uh, you know, like little text, text writing if they have dysgraphia, okay? M for math, for instance. Um, how long does it take them to really write it down? These kids think, oh, it takes forever. They're kind of amazed when they find out how it doesn't take that long. Although if their online pl platform is really complicated, it may take them 10 minutes. And if that's the case, they need to plan for those 10 minutes. Okay, another key idea here. Ooh, I've got to try to get through this. We have more talking time. Um, the other thing we want to do with time is to help the kids see the future, this is big, you need to post when they have Zoom time. So you need to form something like this. You know, this one we sell on my website, it comes with my planners, um, just so they can see the space of time. So here's the example. You fill in when they're gonna have their Zoom meetings and because the homework gets done, the schoolwork gets done in the open spaces. Very important that the kids know what's coming. Hopefully, this fall, things are more predictable, it seems to be, than it was the spring when the poor teachers were all over the map. The kids didn't know one minute to the next what was happening. Now, typically, the kids only have to fill this form out once a week because it should be standardized when they're seeing which teacher, hopefully. Um, and the other important thing on here is to write down lights out for everyone. When are they going to sleep? Okay, and what you're putting to sleep is also all your devices are going to bed. You should collect all the devices, all phones, all video games, whatever, all the stuff. Your kids should not have those devices in their bedrooms because they will keep playing on them and they will then have trouble getting up in the morning and then they will lose self-control during the day. So bedtime is critical. And you'll notice I also put down some family fun on here on Sunday, a family movie. Right now, you guys, you've got to create some fun with your kids because this is not a fun time, but they need to have some fun social activities. So see if you guys can figure that out with your kids. It shouldn't all be about yelling about them, yelling at them, being frustrated with school. We need to set up fun. And the other thing that, that helps to develop that future thinking are calendars. Um, and this is a page from my student planners. And um, I like a month calendar. And then, what a month? Well, month gives the kids the chance to see into the future. A, a planner that only has uh, a week at a time does not develop future thinking. And the other problem that people have, how they misunderstand what goes into a school planner is they only use it for school, for assignments. No, 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 no. You guys, that's not why we have calendars and planners. We want to plan our whole life. So right now, life's a little boring, okay, in terms of 
having things to do on the weekends and after school. Um, maybe for some of you that's opening up, but you want to put those fun things down. So your students should be putting down when they have soccer, when they have a sleepover, um, when they're babysitting, when they have to go to their job, when uh, the, the other aspects of their life, not just school. So you can see here on this page, um, my key idea for you on this page is you should write down work on the day it is assigned, not on the day that it's due. That creates a false expectation for kids because they, they go, oh, it's, I haven't to do anything today. It's not due till Thursday. Well, they have something to do today <laughs> because when Thursday gets around, then it's, they're crammed, they've got other stuff happening, and that's where assignments start falling apart. So write down a work on the day it's assigned, cross it off each day as it goes, and um, that way you keep on top of what is what am I supposed to be doing now? Don't put it down in the future, do it now. That's for daily assignments, crossing them off. And I cross off every day as it goes. Um, so that is a really quick hit on that. I know my school, my planners come with a whole video mini course that helps you understand how to plan, how to use a planner. It is not something that is simple. I remember I, I, I teach professionals and I had one teacher say to me after she went through my program to figure out how to show time and, and do assignment books. She goes, wow, there's a lot more to this than just writing down assignments. And there is. But there's a quick hit of just always starting on the day that it's assigned and crossing off every day well, when all the work is done for that day. So here in closing, um, the boulders in your week, I want you to pay attention to the fact that you need to have food. The brain needs to have food consistently. So have good quality snacks around your house and planning your meals. Um, exercise. This is one of the big problems that the kids are not being able to do right now is to get exercise. So break up the day, plan little mini exercise times, uh, intermissions between classes, do, you know, shoot baskets with a Nerf ball or, you know, do some push-ups or do some, some uh, you know, jumping jacks. Some kind of motion just for a few minutes will help reset your brain because that will help with focus for the next class. They've got to move, these kids do, all of us do. And again, I said sleep over and over again, you've got to get enough sleep. And you also, like I said earlier, you've got to plan some fun because the reason why I plan you guys is to have fun. And, and that's what works the best. You have something to look forward to. And right now that is a challenge during the time of COVID, but um, be creative, create some fun for you and your families, not just staring at computer screens, watching movies. Um, you know, there's such things as playing crazy eights, there's jigsaw puzzles, there's different kinds of games. Help your kids figure out what would be fun and different for your brain. Get your kids' brains away from the devices. They're spending all day long on these things. Their brain needs a break and they'll feel so much better. So your key idea from that. And just remember, you guys, little by little, change doesn't happen overnight in our brains, and your young people are going to grow little by little. You may need to support them in the environment with predictability and consistency and order. And then little by little, we will make things better. If we pay attention to the brain and their brain development so we're not setting unrealistic expectations, we set up spaces that are easier for the brain to work in, and that we help the kids see the future, see what they have to do today and what they have to do tomorrow and weeks beyond. So we can, you can do this, you guys. We will get through this together, okay? Um, it's an interesting time, to put it mildly. It's going to be a long haul this year. And, and I want you to look at this year a little differently. It, it's, don't lower your expectations, but in many ways, you need to adjust your expectations. This is not a typical school year. You're, some of the kids are so bored just sitting, staring at Zoom um, links, and it's just not interactive. They're missing the social element. That's what your teens and your middle school kids are just missing social interaction. So whatever social interaction you can set up for them, even if it has to be by distance, please do so. Um, I bet you a lot of you have already created some little pods of families where your teens can actually hang out with each other, you know, that are safe, safe families that are 
that are uh, monitoring their, their contacts. Um, we want to be able to have kids getting some kind of social interaction, and it's so important for our brains these days. So that's me saying the end, and the rest of the time we can talk. Ask your questions. Wonderful. Mary D, thank you so much. That was such a, uh, a font of practical strategies for parents to try, and we're getting a lot of feedback, people who are ready to um, go out, buy calendars, get more clocks set up, work on standing desks. Um, <laughs> so lots of lots of different tactics and strategies. Um, we do also have a lot of questions, so I'll do my best yes. to, um, to represent as many as possible here. And okay. Quite a few sort of touch on this overlap um, of ADHD and um, and comorbid conditions, or perhaps just dominant um, uh, symptoms. So, for example, the oppositional defiance that comes with ADHD. So, this is a big question: What do you do when your middle schooler just rejects all of your suggestions for systems? All mm -hmm. and they don't have the organizational skills, and they are not accepting of your help. Let <laughs> me well, start with a hard one. Okay. Yes, um, it is. <laughs> it's common. It's a hard one. Yeah, I wish I had a magic wand. I don't know. So, Annie, can they see me or just my slides? Um, they yes, they can toggle to see. Uh, actually, they see you and the slides. Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can see what I have in my hands here, you guys. It's a lovely wand, okay? <laughs> and it was a wand that was made for me by one of my students when he found out that I was a Harry P Potter fanatic. But I always, I always start my sessions when I have new families. I say, see this wand? It's lovely, but it is not magic. You know, I can't go and tap you on the head and, and solve all of your problems and your challenges. If I could, you guys, oh, gosh, I would run around the planet tapping people on the shoulders on the, for free just to get rid of the pain. Um, oppositional defiant, you've got a long history probably of opposition, my guess is, of oppositional defiant behavior. Um, maybe some of you, this is new to COVID. Um, a brain like that is out of control itself. It's really, it, it, it's under a lot of stress and it's looking for some structure, believe it or not. And so I would come at that child with very, pick one thing, one thing that you wanna see focused. And, and you wanna work on, this is a coaching mode. Rather than telling them what they have to do, you can think about, okay, here's your problem. When you're learning, you have to learn at what's called the point of production. So when they have a very specific screw up, let's put it that way, okay, they have suddenly have not turned something in, they're in trouble because something is missing. Rather than tell your kids what they did wrong specifically, it's like, wow, okay, that's not working. What do you think you can do to stop that from happening next time? Where do you think the hole was? Where was the problem? And you're gonna have to dig and stay very centered because metacognitively, they may not be able to do much problem solving. So pick one of your simple things, say, well, since you're having trouble getting to class and remembering, um, timers work for a lot of people. Which timers do we have around the house that would work for you? Do you have some, what about the timers on your iPad? That's how I remember to get to my Zoom meetings is I have a whole you know, screen full of the different times that my sessions start and I set those first thing in the morning when I get to the office. Otherwise I will forget my Zoom meetings. Okay, so something like that, pick one thing and then build on it. That's my best advice mm -hmm. to you because you can't fix everything. So take the low hanging fruit and pick something that they think they can problem solve and then celebrate out the wazoo when they do it right. Okay. Right. Um, th do that. There's an interesting book out there you guys should check into, Interesting Man, uh, Tiny Habits by B.J. Fogg. Tiny Habits by B.J. Fogg. He has an interesting website too. And um, he really talks about how the brain changes behavior and changes habits. And you have to start tiny, tiny, and you have to celebrate every time they do it right. I've always, people in my sessions think I'm crazy because they're, oh, happy dance time, happy dance time. <laughs> and, and I have all my families running around going, happy dance, happy dance, in their own homes without me there. 
because they're celebrating their brain beginning to make different choices. So celebrate every little positive thing and start small. Mm. And as you uh, showed with your chart, um, but an important reminder that um, ADHD brains can lag three to five years behind in these executive functions. So it's about expectations too, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Because you just got to, it's like I had like that, that 13 year old I was talking about who has the fifth, fourth, fifth grade um, maturity levels. You know, you ask him a question and he goes, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know, and, and I, I'm, I, I'm still trying to figure him out. Does he really not know? He's very bright in other levels, but part of it, he just doesn't care. You know, so you, you, you're just, this is where you have to kind of go with the flow, pick your battles carefully, build as you can little by little. And um, get through the whole thing. Maybe you're in a marathon. Yes. Now, of course, um, the other fun thing about middle school is puberty. And <laughs> with that um, emotionality, now I can say this because I have a middle schooler. <laughs> so whew, um, there are a lot of questions about emotional responses. So um, how to best deal with a child who spirals into almost panic when one homework question doesn't make sense um, or who gets overwhelmed looking at like a list of assignments. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have strategies for those kids who are kind of battling that, the, the emotional side of, of ADHD right. plus puberty? Right. So, so Willie, I always start with education with my kids. My, my, my team, my time program, it takes weeks before we get into time, <laughs> time management, because we're really learning about the brain. So you need to help your child understand that their emotionality is a defense mechanism of their brain. Um, we're, we're emotional creatures, not thinking creatures. All sensory information has to come into your brain and passes through what your limbic system, your amygdala, which is I call your emotional brain. It's filtering everything. And it's all about survival. Your emotional brain is all about survival. So it goes into fight, flight, or freeze. Okay, that's what's happening with your anxiety kids. Okay, um, or desire. That's what's happening with your defiant kids. They don't wanna, they wanna do something else. Okay, so this is all operating out of their emotional brains. So you need to educate them that that's what's going on. You know, you don't have to talk about major puberty stuff and that's going on too, but just talk about their brain. Because when you depersonalize it, the kids feel better, all of us feel better. And then um, with that background information, you teach them how to calm their own brain down, just like I did very quickly in the beginning of this presentation. That activating that parasympathetic nervous system with that little arch in their back. They don't have to put their hands behind their backs all the time, but you can just like cool your, you know, calm yourself. So teach them how to do that. But if they're out of control, what you have to do is realize they are out of control. And that means their brain is flooded with cortisol. And that means that cortisol has cut off access to their prefrontal cortex their thinking brain. So you cannot rationalize with a child who is out of control because they literally can't hear you. They cannot mm -hmm. respond. In fact, when you say, honey, just calm down, take a deep breath, that brain interprets your intervention as another attack. So because when a kid looks at a problem and says, I don't know how to do this, all of a sudden they're worried about survival in the classroom. I'm not smart. I'm not going to do this. Mom's going to be mad at me. Blah, blah, blah. Who knows? They have a whole spiral effect of the bad things that are going to happen just because they don't know the word and understand the directions. So when it comes to directions, what I have kids do is I have them do one sentence at a time, and I have them draw a little picture or an image of what does this sentence mean? Because if they can't draw what the teacher wants them to do or kind of do some kind of an image representation of it, they don't understand it. And that's where you get meltdown. Remember I talked about confusion a while ago? Um, it's the confusion part that adds to the anxiety. So your job, if the brain is out of control, is to be very present and stand next to them and say nothing and ideally keep eye contact because that cortisol outburst, that's what the out was fueling the outburst is cortisol. 
it will dissipate typically in around 90 seconds if there's no further stimulation of the, of the trigger, okay? That brain will just, shoo, cortisol drops, and then you just need to be there for them and give them time to chill out. But they need what a brain that's out of control comes back to control with a brain that is in control. So you have to control yourself, get yourself very centered, don't intervene, let them come to center, and then help them problem solve where they're stuck. Hmm. I could have used this last weekend, Mary D. <laughs> 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 no, we're getting a lot of comments. We got one that I'll have to read to you. Um, someone wrote in, we have a 13-year-old with ADHD and ODD. My partner wants to know if you can move in with us. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> people, are getting, people are getting some much-needed help. Um, Good, I'll okay. try to squeeze in a few more questions here. We have okay. about five minutes left. Um, okay. So... A uh, really quick add-on to that last one. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about lying. And it's my understanding that that um, that cortisol reflex, it's kind of fight, flight, freeze, or fib, right? Oh, like or, well, that's part of it. Well, part, what that is is escape. Mm. Okay, fight, flight, or freeze. Got it. So escape, when, you're, when you lie, they think they're escaping. Okay, they think they're escaping the consequences. Yeah, I got it done, mom. Okay, that's really an escape behavior. And whenever you have these behaviors, whenever you have um, some kind of escape behaviors, uh, which is things like lying, um, going, getting into drugs and alcohol, um, checking out and just going to the happy place in their brain, playing video games when they should be working, um, not feeling good is often an escape thing to, oh, I got a tummy ache, I'm sick, you know, I got to go lay down. Often the root of those behaviors, and then, then uh, anger, of course, mm -hmm. um, is that uh, uh, defiant behavior that looks like lots of things, leave me alone, I don't, you know, I don't understand, why do I have to learn this stupid stuff, and uh, that teacher hates me, and, you know, get out of my face, mom. That's all anger, and then you have anxiety and depression on the other end of that. All that is rooted often in learning situations in confusion, you guys. Confusion is at the root of it. Hmm. So when you see those behaviors that are driving you crazy, okay, when you see those behaviors, you calm your brain because it sets your brain off, all right, because you're going to anxiety too or anger or whatever. So you've got to calm your brain and then ask that question, where's the confusion? And you might have to dig. Okay, and then if it's not confusion, then the next question is, what executive functioning skill needs support? Are they having trouble getting started? That's 90% of the problem. So in that case, you say, looks like you're having trouble getting started. There's nothing you're confused about. Okay, tell you what, why don't we meet, you know, set your cube timer, gather yourself together in five minutes, we'll meet at the dining room table. You can work on your homework at that end. I'll finish my work at the other end and we'll support each other because I don't want to do my work either. But we'll just help each other out together because mm -hmm. often that helps just to get started. And this leads into what may be our last question, but it, it's also a biggie. Um, a lot of people concerned about that fine line between having the oversight, as you said, um, setting your child up at the dining room table and then <sighs> helicoptering. They don't want to, they want to make sure that their kids are building the skills they need to succeed in college and beyond. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, do you let them fail? I guess is the big question. Okay. For a lot of people. <laughs> okay. The answer is, okay. They need some bumps. They need some failures and it's better. They do it under your roof than having them go off to college and do a Royal failure. So it is a, it is a fine balancing act. You guys, um, helicoptering is making sure everything is perfect, everything is turned in, everything is da, da, da. You should be more of a coach, okay? A coach steps back, can't go on the field, write this down. Coaches can't go on the field, okay? And a lot of parents who are helicopter parents, they wanna go into the, onto the field so their kids win, so their kids you know, um, uh, are the stars, uh, so the, or, or whatever. We can't go on the field, so it's very painful. We have to watch them. We can't guarantee they don't get hurt. We can't guarantee they're going to be successful. They may fail. That's okay. Because then when they, you want to intervene right at the point of failure pain, 
That didn't feel good staying up all night last night, did it, to get that thing done? No. It was pretty awful when Dad blew up at you, right? Yeah. Do you want to do that again? No. Okay, let's go out for frozen yogurt and think about what you could do differently next time. And that's write down assignments on your calendar. It's setting up schedules. You know, all the problem-solving materials that you use help your kid understand it, help him figure out what he or she would do. Because if you just tell them what to do, they're not learning that. It has to come from within them to be the problem solver. Mm. That's a, a great note to leave it on, that um, you're really trying to give them ownership of the solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wonderful. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. We um, had well over 250 questions. As you can imagine, we got just a fraction of them, but I did try to represent as many as possible. And um, I will just say for the listeners that attitude hears you. Um, we've been hearing a lot from parents of, of middle and high school students, and we're, we're planning more content. So um, we're, we're hopeful that we'll get a lot of these questions answered one way or the other, but for today, um, I just want to extend our sincere thanks to Mary D. Sklar for this excellent webinar. A lot of people are signing up for you to come to their homes. Um, so <laughs> you made a, a wonderful impact, a lot of great ideas for people. Um, and I just want to remind the listeners that we do have um, weekly webinars for uh, hosted by Attitude and our next webinar is next Thursday October 29th, um, and that is on uh, better school behavior, designing and implementing a positive and effective behavior plan. So um, that was touched on in, in some, some ways today. But for now, um, thank you so much for being here, for joining us, and um, we look forward to working with you again, Mary D. Thank you very much for your time. Take care. Hang in thank there, everybody. You. Hang in there. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>